I want to switch gears slightly now into more of just a startup discussion. So, you know, we've, we've kind of covered mobile roadie, we've covered, you know, the mobile market, um, we've covered, you know, do you start with iPhone or Android? Um, what other advice would you give someone who is looking to create um, even just a mobile app? You know, I mean, you help people create mobile apps. So, you know, what, what advice would you give someone looking to create a mobile app or what questions do you get from people looking to create, to create one? Wow. Um, well, I think that people get intimidated because there's a quarter of a million apps out there and how is yeah. mine going to stand out? There's a glut in the market. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, talking about the entrepreneurial side of things, yeah. I think it's, it's find something that you have a passion for, find something that you have a connection to. Yeah. Um, you know, if your dad is one of the biggest real estate people and where you live, like, go do that. Um, if your uncle um, has a connection in fashion and you want to build something in fashion, right. use that connection, like, use what's around you. Um, and I think it, the ecosystem is really important. Like, um, in LA, what is it, Blank Spaces is mm -hmm. down the street? And there's also Coloft now okay. in Santa Monica. Um, they have those in New York as well. They have them, um, they have a ton of activity in Paris with these co-working um, oh, yeah. offices. Um, oh, yeah. What's the main one that, I can't think of the name of it. I'm blanking on the name too, but oh. to be to surround yourself with. Lacantine. Okay. Is yes, that is it. Mm -hmm. And so to surround yourself with um, other people that are, you know, in that ecosystem, and you guys all need the same stuff and the same advice exactly. and everything. Um, I I wouldn't work out of a coffee shop. I wouldn't work out of your house. Okay. I would go where other entrepreneurs are and feed off of that buzz. Mm -hmm. So you, when you started Mobile Roadie, your your background is more um, services oriented of yeah. some nature, right? It was completely service okay. It was a design agency, and okay. we built websites, work for hire. How convenient! Design! <laughs> yeah, it is convenient, but it's, it's probably the worst business I could possibly think of. Really? If you want to build a long-term business that yeah. scales. It simply doesn't scale. You get a new job, you got to hire more people. Yeah. You lose a job, you got to fire people. Constantly trying to figure out how to balance that, you know, the health yeah. with the revenue stream coming in. Yeah, and I basically spent a decade trying to scale what is not a scalable business. Yeah. And so um, mobile roadie is the exact opposite. I mean, um, someone could sign up right now and do it themselves, and we don't need to do anything. Mm -hmm. Wow. So is this the first time, you know, I mean, you started a design agency. So is this the first, like, true technology startup that you've done? Yeah. Great. Um, well, almost. Um, I started <laughs> a company called nesting.com. Okay. And this was in 2007. Uh -huh. And the idea was it was going to be a Facebook for moms. And uh, we made it very pretty, and we made it functional, and we took, spent way too much money and <laughs> took way too long to launch it. And by that time, by 2008, I mean, Facebook was already just yeah. totally unstoppable. So what did you take out of that learning experience that you've applied to Mobile Roadie? A lot. Um, I mean, we raised a million and a half dollars in two and a half weeks in 2007. Two and a half weeks? Yeah. How and much again? A, a million and a half. In two and a half weeks, and so it is possible, folks. It's totally possible, <laughs> but it's it's not smart. I mean, yeah. we we spent so much money. I think at one point I was touring a data center in El Segundo because we were going to have our own rack. Like wow. Like I, I made every mistake you possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, hired way too many people, spent way too much money, took way too long to launch the product. <laughs> yeah. um, we had to go out and raise more money before yeah. the product was launched. So mm -hmm. we spent over a million dollars on this website, and I and I remember wow, being in the room with a VC. Launched. Um, showing him what we had, and he's like, how far are you away from launch? And we said a couple months, and he's yeah. like, and how much have you spent? And mm. we dropped what we spent, and he literally, like, I thought the guy was going to fall off his chair. And I was embarrassed. I mean, we spent way, way too much money on this website. Wow. So with Mobile Roadie, we um, built the thing for about 30000 mm -hmm. Um We launched it in three months while we still had a full-time job servicing clients at Fluid. Wow. And um, we are heavily angel-backed, but yep. we haven't gone the VC route. And now, now, why? Why? Because this is a really, this is a very important you, piece that I really want to talk about because a lot of startups, too, ask us what makes sense. Do we go angel? Do we go VC? And if we go VC, which type of VC? Because there are different types this and is people don't know that. There's a simple answer to that. So you, you only take VC money if you have to and if it's going to yeah. pour rocket fuel into your growth. Okay. Um, angels um, let you retain control of the company. Mm -hmm. um, let you, um, they're often more active than VCs from what right. I've seen. So in terms of an advisory role, they'll actually yeah. can play a more active role that way. Yeah. And they're not managing, you know, well, depends. If you're Paige Craig, you're managing 50 investments, but <laughs> in general. Yeah, Paige Craig, some sort of angel investor in Los Angeles. Hmm. He's on a surfboard right now. He's not watching. No, actually, he's beach. in Santa Monica because I ran into him earlier. Oh. <laughs> At the beach. 
Um, and I think that, you know, I've, so now it went from trying to pitch VCs to VCs calling us now because okay. they see what we're doing and they're interested. And I take the calls and I talk to them and I want to build relationships, but mm -hmm. I have no desire to give up control right. and dilute everybody. And um, you really give up. It's very expensive money. No one ever does yeah. the calculation, but it's something like 30 or 40 percent interest per year wow. equivalent for people that have a successful exit within four or five years. And yeah. so that's really expensive. That's a lot. It's a lot. That's definitely a lot. Having said that, there's great VCs. Of um, course. Good VCs like, you know, Mark Schuster in LA is so active. He mm -hmm. knows everybody. Um, they, they can pour rocket fuel into your growth and mm -hmm. can be very useful. So knowing that you don't want to take VC money at this point, you know, I won't say ever, but at this point, um, but you do want to build relationships with them, how do you softly, gently let them down to say, not interested right now, but let's, you know. I say it up front. I mean, okay. I mean, if I get an email, I'll say, you know, we're not raising, but I'm happy to talk. Yeah. And it takes it off the table, and then mm -hmm. you can talk. And um, it basically, it's an interesting paradigm switch, because then they're selling you on how great their fund is, and yeah. who their founding partner is, and all the other portfolio companies, and okay. all sorts of stuff. Okay. And then talk a little bit about the types of VCs. Um, well, so there's, there's um, different sizes of funds, mm -hmm. of course, and there's different focuses. Um, if you go and you raise money from a Sequoia, okay. um, you're giving up a bit more, mm -hmm. and you also have Sequoia on your resume, which, <laughs> you know, never hurts. Right. Um, there's smaller VCs. There's also a weird, uh, I shouldn't say weird, there's an interesting um, hybrid happening right now, mm -hmm. sort of, they're, they're like super angels. And That's a huge term right now, and super it's angels that are kind of encroaching in the VC space. They are. Will. Dave McClure is one of them. Uh -huh. uh, Paige is one of them. Yeah. Um, and then these angels that are investing maybe up to half a million dollars, which used to be, right. what did angel money used to be, like 100 grand? 100 grand tops. Yeah. And, and they're, they're really providing a lot of advice, and they're building their own ecosystems. I mean, Dave yeah. McClure just raised a bunch of money, and it's called 50 startups, 500 startups. Something, yeah, something like that. Something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's fascinating what's going on. And, yeah. and VCs, I think what's, what's going to happen is they're going to be more growth capital. Mm -hmm. Like, you've gotten okay. to this certain point, now I need $20 million. Well, an angel's not going to write you a check for that, so you right. need to go VC. Wow. Okay. Um, any, any other startup advice in general? So we've covered kind of VC stuff now. We've covered the development side. What about, what about team building? Where do you find your team? Where should people That's start? That's the hardest part. Um, it is, and that this is always you know what, what? It comes down to when I'm talking to people. I have found my best people on Craigslist. What? I know that sounds crazy. Are you serious? I've had such Did success you hear on that? Craigslist. You found the best people on Craigslist. I have. My my <laughs> my co-founder and creative director and I met seven years ago through a Craigslist ad. Okay, we definitely need to see how Michael Schneider writes a Craigslist ad. Okay, there's some up right there right now. <laughs> Just go search for Mobile Roadie. Go um, look for Mobile Roadie on Craigslist. Someone, please do it. And with Craigslist, I mean, you get you get a a ton of stuff that's terrible, yeah. and you get one or two that are really, really good. Okay. Um, you get your needles. LinkedIn, uh, poaching. Oh. Fantastic resource. True. Um, I always get kind of nervous if I see LinkedIn on one of my employee screens, <laughs> but um, it's really useful. Uh -huh. um, and what, what do you look for when you're trying to determine if someone's a good fit? I mean, obviously it's really personal, but you know, are there any basic tenants that you would recommend? You know, I, I probably do this wrong, but I really go by my gut. Um, I hey, I, I'm a gut person. It's Maybe a gut person, but, but studies have shown that you're, you're pretty much <laughs> wrong the majority of the time. Yeah. Even if you got a really good gut. I don't know. Mine's right. Is, Quite is good. yours good? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I need to learn it's from really that. It's really sensitive, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that, um, I think that culture fit is the number one thing we look yeah. for. I mean, you know, you put an ad for a PHP developer and, you know, 20 people can do PHP, but mm -hmm. um, 15 of them are you know, maybe going to be awkward with your team or right. they're, they're going to be flaky. Um, I've had some really weird flaky employee experiences lately. That <laughs> that's why I'm saying like the gut thing doesn't always work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would sit down with someone and see if you like talking to them 20 minutes later and if it's comfortable mm -hmm. and if it's good. I mean, that's really important. Like y an employee doesn't need to be your best friend, but they need right. to be able to fit in a team. Yeah kind of tough when you've got the one person that's kind of off doing their own thing yeah. and doesn't really match everyone else. Even if they're really talented, like yeah. it's detrimental it's to the team.